I think this could be a time when the markets respond differently than they have in the past, because in the past they've responded positively to the Fed caving and going back to easy money. This time around, it could be that they're going to, instead of seeing, oh, lots more money for the stock market, they're going to see, oh, lots more money for inflation. And that's going to spook them. So I, I think this time is much more interesting than the previous times. This week's specials with Miles Franklin Precious Metal Investments. One ounce Canadian silver maple leaves for only five twenty-five over spot. And 1,000 ounce silver bars for only one sixty-five over spot per ounce. Call us at one 881 liberty That's one 815 4237 Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And back with us today is John Rubino from dollarcollapse.com. John, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, Elijah. Good to talk to you again. We're recording this on Tuesday. In the last couple of days, we got the news that Powell was renominated as the next Fed chair. So your perspective on this, because some people were looking for the more progressive Brainerd to be um, nominated, which might mean even more easy money policy for the future. So we saw a pullback in metals. We saw now a pullback in uh, kind of a big pullback in the NASDAQ right now as we speak. So your perspective on how the markets reacted to this news? Well, it looks like the start of the taper tantrum, right? I mean, first of all, the, the idea of um, changing chairman of the Fed making a difference is silly. Uh, you know, go all the way back to Alan Greenspan in the 1990s and uh, trace the path of monetary stupidity up to the present. And it's pretty much consistent. You know, these, these guys are locked into a failed model and they're all making the same mistakes. So replacing Powell with somebody else who's, you know, going to be in favor of easier money, uh, you know, we're, we're already buying hundreds of billions of dollars of government bonds each year. Interest rates are at zero. Longer term rates are, are the lowest they've ever been in American history, other than, you know, squiggling around in the last few years. Um, so the idea that we're going to have easier money from there and we should be disappointed, the markets should be disappointed at the, uh, the, the level of monetary tightness going forward is just silly. You know, at, at, under Powell, what's going to happen is the same thing that would have happened un, under anybody else they named. And that is um, rising inflation will force the Fed to at least take some steps in the direction of tightening. The markets will freak out. The Fed will back right off and promise not to tighten anymore. And, uh, and, and you know, then we'll see what happens. But I, I think one thing that's, um, that's fairly unique about this time around, this iteration, is that people might perceive it as permanent. In other words, um, I think the markets, are, there's a good chance that they'll correctly perceive that if the Fed can't tighten now with um, labor as short as, as tight as it is and um, inflation rising at five or six or seven or eight percent, depending on who's doing the measuring, then they can never tighten. And, and so this is it. It's the end of even the concept of monetary tightening. And we're going to have basically uh, QE, um, negative interest rates, and very possibly UBI, um, you know, universal basic income going forward forever. And who wants to hold the currency of a country that's doing that? You know, so I, I think this could be a time when the markets respond differently than they have in the past, because in the past, they've responded positively to the Fed caving and going back to easy money. This time around, it could be that they're going to, instead of seeing, oh, lots more money for the stock market, they're going to see, oh, lots more money for inflation. And that's going to spook them. So I, I think this time is much more interesting than the previous times um, and maybe a lot more dramatic. Now, when it comes to the Fed chair not making a difference, essentially what you're saying is that long term, the Fed has no option than to inflate because otherwise the markets are going to freak out. Yeah, basically, inflate or die has been the situation of the Fed since literally the 1990s. Um, and every time they tighten even a little bit, they, they pop whatever bubble is uh, is 
peaking at the time. So, you know, Greenspan uh, increased interest rates a little bit. The tech stock bubble burst and we had a really nasty recession. Um, I think it was Bernanke during the housing market, right? The bubble of the last decade. Um, he tightened just a little bit. The housing bubble burst and we had the Great Recession. Um, so the idea that uh, anybody can tighten long term is ludicrous right now. You know, we, we haven't been able to do it um, in the past when our finances were a lot better than they are now. So um, they are in that box that, that we've been talking about. And, you know, and all the time that you and I have been talking, that's been one of the main points that people on the sound money slash libertarian side of this argument make is that the Fed is basically in a box. They, they have no choice um, but to continue to ease because the alternative is a 1930s style deflationary depression that they get blamed for. Um, and as debt goes up, that box gets tighter and tighter. And now the Fed is at the point where, you know, it's completely possible they literally can't even raise the Fed funds rate by half a point now. And it's completely possible that they can't cut back on their bond buying by more than just, uh, you know, a few billion dollars a month. You know, they, they may not be able to even do that before the financial markets freak out. And we're seeing that in the last couple of days where tech stocks have tanked. Um, they tanked on Monday, today's Tuesday, they're, they're tanking again today. Um, and it, uh, it could be because they perceive you know, a little couple of steps in the direction of tightening and they don't want to hear about it. <laughs> you know, they, they do not want to see even these little steps. You mentioned how a lot of this is meaningless. What we're seeing um, with respect to precious metals as well, this volatility, we saw the rally in anticipation of Brainerd being nominated. And then we saw the crash when uh, Powell was nominated, renominated. So this doesn't really mean anything long term for precious metals. Oh, no, it absolutely doesn't mean anything for precious metals. The, the environment for safe haven assets in general and gold and silver in particular is phenomenal. You know, we, we have inflation and we have incredibly easy money and we have multi-trillion dollar deficits going forward for as, they are, uh, as far as the eye can see. That, none of that is going to change. Um, so gold and silver will continue to do well overall. But there are going to be squiggles along the way. No bull market is a straight line. And... Um, I think just the financial financial markets in general still have this idea that there's adult supervision out there and that there is a way to fix things if we just have the right people and the right policies. So the phase change in market psychology will come when people realize that it doesn't matter who's there. You know, we could have our George Washington or Abraham Lincoln in charge and, and it will not matter because there is no policy that fixes this much debt. You know, there, there's no magic interest rate or magic marginal tax rate or magic, um, um, uh, you know, health care policy or immigration policy. None of that is going to fix our financial problems because we owe way too much money. You know, it's a very simple calculus. And that is that when, when you owe more money than you can pay back, your life becomes uncontrollable. And we're there now, you know, and, and it's just a matter of the financial markets um, understanding it and then starting to act accordingly. And, uh, you know, it feels like they're, um, you know, the early stages of that are, are taking place now. But the big deal comes when the Fed, when the Fed caves again here, you know, and I think they, three or four more days like this in the stock market is all it would take, you know, for them to cave and say, oh, did we say we were going to taper next year? And did we mention higher interest rates in, in 2022? Never mind, you know, we, we care about financial stability more than we care about inflation. And when they send that market, uh, that message to the markets and they say so explicitly, which they're going to have to at some point, uh, then everything changes because then we're in an inflationary world. Everybody will have to agree that that's where we are. And, um, you know, people will start panic buying the stuff they might have bought two years from now because they don't know what the price is going to be in two years. And that'll push prices up even further in the short run, which causes more panic buying and so on. So, you know, that's the consumer side of things. And then on the financial side, who wants to own financial assets that pay you in a currency that is actively being devalued by its government at an accelerating rate? And the answer is nobody. You know, who wants a government bond yielding one and a half percent when inflation is going to be five, six, seven percent basically forever, if not much higher? You know, and, and that changes everything. And then we got to go back to the 1970s for some analogs, you know, when uh, inflation started to perk up and it didn't get crazy 
um, at first, uh, but it still made people suspicious of government bonds. And so long-term interest rates started going up. And then inflation went up even more and long-term interest rates went up even more until, you know, towards the end of the decade, you had uh, double digit interest rates and double digit inflation and gold and silver going straight up for the last two years of the decade. Um, probably something like that is coming, but that would just be the intermediate stage of what's coming now because um, we're actually in pretty good financial shape back in the 70s. We could handle higher interest rates without blowing up. We can't do that now. So if interest rates start to go up, which by the way, they are too, you know, interest rates are actually rising the last couple of days as everything else um, gets volatile. Um, as interest rates go up, that raises the cost uh, for basically the leveraged speculators out there, which is to say anybody who bought a house with a mortgage in the last few years and anybody who's got stocks on margin and pretty much every hedge fund that is using leverage to do whatever it's doing, all of those guys blow up when their interest costs um, rise beyond a certain point. Um, and governments who have mostly financed themselves with short-term money because that's where rates are zero or negative um, will find that their interest costs are exploding when their rates, the rates at which they have to borrow, go positive and then start to rise into well into positive territory. And so government finances blow up too. That's all out there. And it won't take much from here. It just takes a continuation of this year's inflation rate for another couple of years. And that's, that's not really a tall order when you consider what's happening out there, you know, just the wage side of things. Um, workers are figuring out that they can ask for higher wages and that they can go on strike and they can win. Uh, and they are so underwater compared to where they should be. If, if we were in normal labor markets for the past 20 years, workers in the U.S. would be making twice what they're making now. So they've got a lot of ground to make up. And with their newfound confidence, a lot of them are going for it. So we're going to see much higher wages for sure. Uh, you know, barring a, an immediate um, recession from here, you know, if the stock market tanks and that pulls us into recession, all bets are off. But if we have what we have this year and it continues no, another couple of years, you'll see double digit wage increases, which the Fed considers to be real inflation, which will increase the pressure on the Fed to do something. And if they don't do anything, that's the signal, you know, that they'll never do anything because if they're not going to try and um, restrain double digit wage growth, then there's really nothing out there that's going to cause them to raise interest rates. So very interesting few years coming. And, um, you know, with the 1970s as our, you know, intermediate term analog, a very dramatic couple of years. Definitely. And it seems kind of ironic, I guess, as we see this inflation raging, we see the dollar index rising. So it's like, well, what is happening there? That's one of the fascinating parts of the story is that, um, see, normally, in economics 101, you say if rising in, if inflation is rising, that makes the currency less valuable by definition, right? That's what inflation is. So you wouldn't want to own that currency or you wouldn't want to own it at last year's exchange rate. Uh, but this, for the first time in history, is a global inflation. Everybody's making the same stupid mistakes with their currencies that we're making with ours. So when inflation picks up around the world, it's perceived to be more of a problem for other countries than it is for us, which makes the dollar relatively attractive <laughs> compared to the euro and to most emerging market currencies. So let's look at why that is. If you're Brazil or Chile or somebody like that, um, you have a big proportion of your population who's just getting by, um, which means that uh, by the time they get done paying for gas for their car uh, and food and rent, they don't have any money left over. So let inflation pick up in a country like that, and, and you're forcing people to decide which of those three things, gas, food, and rent, they're not going to pay this month. In other words, their, their life is pushed over the edge, very possibly, and they're likely to take to the streets. You know, you get civil unrest when something like that happens, and then you get regime change. Um, so this is a much bigger deal for emerging markets than it is here, which means those currencies are way less attractive now. You know, the uh, um, Argentine peso or something like that. Forget it. You don't want to own that. You want to own dollars um, if you have a choice between those two things. Now, over in Europe, um, they screwed up the pandemic. Well, I don't want to say they screwed up the pandemic thing. I think the pandemic thing was just never a fixable problem. 
in in the terms that we were using. So what happened was they, um, you know, besides the ongoing financial mistakes that they were making, they uh, they locked everybody down and uh, and thought they were ahead of it. Thought the pandemic was going to be over this year, and then they went off lockdown, and then you know cases came back, and so they're going back to these really draconian lockdowns, and people are taking to the streets. You see these. By the way, this is very underreported in the U.S. It seems like a bigger story uh, than it's than you would think by watching CNN, but you've got these crowds to the horizon in Rome um, who are demanding an end to um, you know forced vaccinations and lockdowns and things like that, and you've got um, Dutch people fighting with the police in the street. What, how bad do things have to be before the Dutch go to war with their cops? You know, that's just something that you would never expect to see. And yet we're seeing it out there. And you have to go to YouTube to see the videos because we, um, the American press isn't showing it. But um, Europe, it, oh, and then Germany is losing Angela Merkel now and has to form a new government. And who knows what that's going to be? Uh, in France, it looks very possibly like Marine Le Pen might win the next election. And she's an anti-Euro conservative. So um, the, the background problems of the Eurozone are now being replaced by some front burner stuff that's very serious. So Again, you know, who wants euros if you can hold dollars? Because the U.S. just have the has these relatively minor problems. We, you know, we have big problems, but uh, they're relatively minor compared to the immediate stuff that's going on in so many other countries. And then you've got China with the uh, the Evergrande thing, where their real estate market is kind of imploding. You know, and what does that mean? Where you know they're a very highly leveraged real estate economy, much more so than the U.S. Um, so that's a big deal, you know, so we look positively pa uh, placid compared to a lot of these other places, but we're not. I mean, we're heading for that same financial cliff that everybody else is. It's just that maybe we're we're going marginally more slowly than some of these other countries. And that makes the dollar look relatively good. But it isn't good. You know, you, you don't want to own a major fiat currency in this world. And the dollar is the major fiat currency. So uh, I, I think the dollar's strength relative to other currencies might go on for a while, but its actual strength in terms of buying power uh, is headed nowhere but down now. Yeah, you mentioned the civil unrest in the, the EU right now um, with respect to all these mandates and all that. Do you see that getting worse this coming year? Well, the pandemic stuff is just that people are sick of being locked down. The rich are getting dramatically richer. Through all, through all this, whereas small businesses are being bankrupted and regular people are losing their, their livelihoods. And it's perceived that that's not fair. Um, and so we could have rising civil unrest based on rising income and wealth inequality as this continues. You know, if they try to go back to lockdowns, which will enrich Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg while bankrupting a bunch more small businesses, you know, I, I think people are legitimately mad about um, that whole thing. And if they try to go back to, and do it again, you know, the um, mandatory vaccines, I think, is, is going to be a real flashpoint going forward. And we, we saw the, uh, you know, not the civil unrest result of this, but the political unrest in the most recent elections that the U.S. held. We had some, you know, off-year governor's elections, which nobody really pays attention to in normal times. But uh, the guys who were supposed to win, who are on the vaccine lockdown side, um, had a really hard time of it. The guy in Virginia lost big to somebody he was supposed to just crush. And the, um, the governor of New Jersey almost lost to somebody who nobody even knew he was. You know, it was just a, it, it was so close that it was a shocker. And a big part of the reason for that is that people are just mad about how things are being managed out there right now. So you've got uh, these school closures, which are freaking people in the suburbs out and, and everybody else, because, you know, what are they going to do with their kids for another year if they close schools? That, that's really hard where where. The, um, the ruling class who can work online if they want to, they, they don't suffer at all if uh, their kids are out of school for a year. But somebody who has to go off to a job and um, can't afford daycare, what do they do? Anyhow, so th these are issues that are going to play a big role in the U.S. midterm congressional elections, which happen next year. And that could be a, a political earthquake if, um, if today's polls carry over into uh, the next November. Um, so there's a lot of 
you know, there, there are a lot of really dramatic stuff that could happen over the next few years in politics and in finance. And none of it points in a positive direction for financial stability. All of it is, um, is destabilizing. Uh, and it doesn't look like there's any solution out there. It doesn't look like anybody's um, coming up with a plan. Anybody at the very top of our government is coming up with a plan um, that will stabilize things. They're doing things that will destabilize things further. And uh, I don't think it's going to go well for them if they keep it up. Now, I was recently uh, reading an article you had written, kind of a commentary on, um, I think it was uh, the Buy Nothing program. And it, it's very interesting where... Uh, a lot of these different solutions are popping up of people building communities and sharing things and working in this new economy, right? So a lot of the time we talk about it on this channel, how can we prepare for the crisis ahead? And we've talked about precious metals before, but your perspective on some of these new solutions that are being rolled out now. Well, yeah, I think I think free people left to themselves kind of um, organically come up with solutions that that work well, at least for them, you know, and we're seeing that with the uh, the homestead movement. Yeah, all of a sudden, everybody wants some land and, and they, they want to be partially food self-sufficient. And I think that's great. You know, it's one of the things we should have been doing all along. But the recent troubles have led to a, a spread of that kind of an aspiration. And I, I think that's a great subculture. You know, the people who are are, are really into home gardening, and uh, you know, in a, in a small town, clubs spring up to spread knowledge, and then farmers markets expand, and people can sell what they haven't uh, eaten or canned for the next year. And 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 so you get a really, you know, it, it goes back to a hundred years ago kind of economy, which was a much much healthier, much more locally based economy. And the uh, the buy nothing movement. Is is kind of like that. It, it's think of it as Craigslist, but with no prices. You know, you just because you've been accumulating so much useless stuff all these years in our consumerist society, um, you want to get rid of a lot of it, or you would at least um, you would like to see it find a good home where it's actually used instead of just sitting in your garage. So you post it on a on a say a Facebook page for buy nothing, and um, somebody who needs a cell phone charger or a table lamp or a, a handsaw or something like that comes in and uh, swings over to your house and picks it up. You know, you meet one of your neighbors, you do a favor for them. So you're banking a favor at the same time you're getting rid of stuff and uh, you become um, more enmeshed in your community um, as opposed to, say, just dumping it off at Goodwill or something like that, where it's totally um, faceless, you know and totally anonymous. Uh, so this is another thing that is bringing us back to the way we used to live, where we knew our neighbors. You know, we knew who was living in our town and we uh, we understood what the big issues there were and who needed help and who was doing well and all that. And, you know, this is helping take us to that place. So to the extent that it spreads, I think it's a good thing, you know, and, and I don't think that's a solution for everybody everywhere, but it's a solution for some people in some places. And in a, in a really healthy society, that's what we should be looking for. You know, the people on at ground level should be figuring out what works best for them and creating a community around those values and those practices. And then you end up with this mosaic of lots of different ideas being tried. And the ones that, uh, that seem to be most applicable for most people spreading and uh, and you get a very healthy society from something like that instead of this top down thing that we've got now where, you know, the same rules apply to everybody. Um, and really, maybe they shouldn't apply to anybody, but we can't do anything about it because it, it's coming from on high, you know, and, and to the extent that we're getting away from that. Um, this could be one of those things that, uh, you know, how when a person has a heart attack, but they survive it, all of a sudden they change their lifestyle completely. This could be one of those kind of come to Jesus moments for for the country. That's a very optimistic take. <laughs> and I don't necessarily think that uh, that's the dominant theme of the next 10 years. I think financial crisis is the dominant theme. Uh, but it could be a sub theme and it could be a positive thing that has really lasting repercussions for us. No, and I think it's really important to remember, you know, even though there is, it looks like a crisis coming or a, for, uh, a worsening of the current crisis, you know, we can each do our own part to help our community out and help each other prepare for this and really 
uh, work together in all of this. And so I guess, John, we really appreciate all these insights you've sh shared with us today. Before we let you go, did you want to share with the viewers any last thoughts you had and where people can find you online? Yeah, well, an awful lot of this is also an investment theme. And I think it's very important to keep in mind that uh, crisis equals opportunity. Uh, the more we screw things up, the more opportunities that creates for people who invest wisely going forward. You know, watch the movie The Big Short and uh, see how it went for some people who correctly diagnosed the housing bubble in the last decade. Uh, well, there, there are multiple bubbles now that you can bet against and make money from. So I, I think that um, as bad as things seem, there's a very happy side to this. And that is that you can protect your family and or make a ton of money if you get this right. So look into what might be possible um, financially um, in terms of, um, you know, how you arrange your finances to take advantage of what's coming. And, you know, it's possible that this is the, the best financial decade of your life, even if uh, the world is burning around you. All right. And where can our viewers find you online? I run dollarcollapse.com, which is, you know, a site that talks about all of this stuff um, updated daily. So um, come on in, add your email address to the join our email list uh, page, and um, I'll just send you whatever I write for free going forward. John, once again, thank you so much for your time and God bless. Thanks, Elijah. This is Dunnigan Kaiser, founder of Liberty and Finance. I'm now a licensed gold and silver broker for Miles Franklin. Call me directly for the physical gold and silver that you need at the best price with personalized private service from one of the oldest and best companies in the business. 31 years strong, A plus rated by the Better Business Bureau. Zero complaints, licensed and bonded. For physical delivery, vault storage, or precious metals IRAs, excellent prices, privacy, and confidentiality. Pay by check, money order, ACH, bank wire, or Bitcoin, satisfaction guaranteed. For fastest service, just call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 888-81-LIBERTY. And either I or one of my sons and fellow brokers will call you back as soon as we can and understand your needs.